Hello, everyone, and welcome to our closing conversations with the Berlich family, the owners and the founding family of Byright. Yep. Uh, we'll get started momentarily. As you can see in the chat, uh, please introduce yourself. We'd like to know who you are. Uh, and if you have any questions for us, uh, the panelists, as we go to the right, if you haven't used it before, you'll see chat, a tab for questions, and a tab for people up toward the top. Uh, just put your questions into the questions tab. If you like a question that somebody else asks, hit the little heart next to it. It'll be promoted. The more people that vote for it, the higher uh, the top of the list it will go. And then if you want to connect directly with one another while we talk, go to the people tab. We'll keep an eye on chat. And, um, and let me uh, make some introductions, introductions here for our panelists. Thanks, by the way. Uh, Aaron, Bill, and Zachary for being here. We really appreciate your time. Um, so first, Bill Berlich. He is the CEO of Byright Food Service Distributors. Um, his leadership has been instrumental in the continuation of Byright's family business uh, values and their objectives. Uh, he has 40 years of experience within the company. And uh, right now, yeah, your focus, Bill, seems to be on just setting the company and, and your family up for success, as far as I can tell. So what a great role for you at this you. point after 40 years. Thank you. Um, Aaron Berlich is the president of Byright. Um, Aaron, you grew up in the industry. In almost every capacity of the family business, I understand, from the warehouse and trucks to sales uh, and purchasing for nine years, you've been managing the company's military and export sales, uh, and you're now responsible for ensuring the various departments uh, at Byright function together, and that uh, Byright's dedication to great customer projects, uh, products are delivered on a day-to-day -day basis. Welcome, thank you very much for your time. Thanks and then Zach, is the, you bet. Uh, Zach is the chief financial officer. Uh, he is Bill's son, as is Aaron. Uh, Zach's worked at Byright since 2009 and oversees finance and sales. So I am Sean Hutchinson. I'm one of the partners at Ready for Next Global. Uh, you can find out more about us at readyfornext.com. Let's jump right in because this is our time is limited and we want to make the best of it. Um, so guys, Byright is now a third generation business. Bill, you're second generation. Zach and Aaron, you're the third generation. That puts you in very rare company because for the most part family businesses only about 12 percent of family businesses make it to yes, keeps falling off unfortunately so we'd really like to know what has gotten you to this point in your opinion to get this some things i imagine that you've had to do fairly intentionally so um what did you do to prepare for the intergenerational transition tell us a little bit about what had worked for you, and then maybe some of the things that haven't worked so well and that you've learned from as you went. Bill, why don't we start with you? Okay, thank you. Uh, just as background information, uh, my father and his cousin, John Barilich, started the company in uh, 55 years ago, actually. And uh, I was a graduate of Sacred Heart, oh, excuse me, of USF, and I received my undergraduate degree there, and then I received my California teaching credential in 1973. But during my education and during summers and time off from school, uh, I often worked in, in the family business. And at that time, Byright had about 10 employees. And my brother, who is seven years younger, also worked with the company uh, early on in terms of uh, throughout his education. And then I think we both decided at some point that we wanted to make a career in the food service business. But when, when we joined the company, Byright had maybe 15 employees. So that integration was really quite simple. And we started as my sons did, you know, uh, in the warehouse, driving trucks, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, you know, it's so much easier when the organization is small to be able to do that effectively. Um, we made a, uh, my brother and I made a decision as we anticipated that we would have another generation of barrelages join our business, that the requirement would be that they, at a minimum, receive an undergraduate degree and then work outside the business for three years. And the objective that we had was that they found a career that they found fulfilling. Uh, we didn't feel that it was very important for us, at least uh, for our egos, that our, our children got involved in the business. And then my three sons followed that path. 
worked outside the business, got their undergraduate and postgraduate degrees, and at some point made the decision to apply with to our organization, at which point they had a resume that they had built and they had a skill set and they had uh, experience with other organizations that potentially would add value to our company. So uh, that was really the path that, that certainly my brother and I chose. My brother has subsequently retired. Uh, my sons obviously are ac actively involved. And there's actually a third son who's at a uh, captive insurance meeting at, at, in Atlanta. His name is Nathan. He's the oldest of my three sons. And Nathan is our chief executive officer. Yeah, that's just kind of a backdrop in terms of uh, how they got in, involved in the business. And then just I would add that additionally, I think our success is because our family unit has always been very strong. So to expect siblings to participate in a business without really caring and respecting one another, I think is impossible to do. So I think mm -hmm. you know, I probably would credit my wife in terms of establishing a family unit where people respected one another and cooperated, and hence they've been successful in terms of managing our business, not without challenges, of course, but uh, I'm very proud of them. Thank you, Bill. Aaron and Zach, you're kind of coming at it from the other direction as the incoming generation. How did you see the preparation for this? Yeah, you know, uh, our, our generation is has been a little bit different in terms of how we got involved in my dad's generation. Just when he got involved, you know, Byred had about 20 employees. Uh, you know, now we're, we're over 300. So it's a little bit of a different corporate structure. So we actually, when my uncle decided to leave, one of the things we did was, was bring in an outside consultant who kind of helped my brothers and I and my dad really kind of take a look at the business. And, and I think, you know, probably helped us have some tools, uh, in terms of, you know, how to look at things and how to kind of react or how to communicate. So, you know, I think we, and I think it will come up as we have this discussion is, you know, we put in a lot of work on, on really communicating. Uh, and, and I think it helped both in our personal lives and in our business lives, but really how to communicate and how to, you know, in some ways realize that in, in business, you know, your disagreements aren't about the business. They're just about things that are happening within the business. And mm -hmm. you know, if we can agree on some certain goals and, you know, values and how we want to run our business, you know, really, you know, that starts a process. And then, you know, we can kind of work on it from there. But it, it's realizing really how to talk to one another and, and how to also listen and just really, uh, you know, to, to put your ego aside and realize mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, we, we have different departments and, you know, we all have kind of different ways of looking at the business, but we all want to see it succeed. And we all talked about wanting to pass it on to the next generation. So, you know, once we kind of built that, that foundation, I think we were able to, you know, move things around a little bit better and, and, and again, kind of not be afraid to, to talk about disagreements because they were really, they weren't a disagreement about how we wanted the business to be. They were just, uh, you know, how we were going to get there. And, you know, those yeah. things are kind of learning to enjoy that process as well. So uh, it, it's, I think we would have failed if we just thought it would all happen naturally. You know, I think it's something that has, has taken a lot of look, work. Uh, you know, and honestly, my, my dad's been very nice of, of uh, saying good things about my mother, but he's been really pushing us as well. And, you know, I think, taking lessons that he learned from working with his brother and, and his dad and and being open about that and, and some of his failings and, and, and some of his successes and, and sharing those with us and, and you know, kind of pushing us to, to keep that vision in mind. I like to come up for me how intentional that has been for you guys, that it's been a learning process, that you communicate a lot, that you tie it to family values, which I think is super important because it provides an anchor and uh, you've actually reduced risk in the business by having good succession planning, which is uh, something that business owners often struggle with, even mm -hmm. as the business gets bigger. So we've seen that. Hey, Zach, what about you? What would you add to that? You know, I think the hardest thing uh, in the transition was really, you know, before we took these executive roles, we sort of worked in our own silos and were able to, um, you know, work uh, in the the 
the area of expertise that we that we were trained in and that we uh, grew up doing and making the transition to being on the executive team we had to work together as uh, as a management team and, and and to do that we had to figure out how to leave the family baggage at home and mm. uh, work as professional people and so I think that was uh, when Aaron mentioned communication, you know, the hardest thing was learning how to communicate um, as as executives and not and not as brothers, you know, as being able to realize that, you know, there is a one common goal uh, and that's the success of the family company. And what we do at work is separate from what we do at home and, and learning that life balance uh, was really crucial in taking the next step and being uh, the next leaders of the company. Yeah, I think that's so important for leadership, that work-life balance and understanding where the boundaries are, especially in family business, right? Where where does business stop? Family values, and I know it's important to you. So how does it um, show up, let's say, on a daily basis uh, at Byright? Where can you see it in the company? Not just in yourselves, but how does it sort of travel out into the company? Bill, you want to start there? Well, I, I also wanted to make the point that when my sons have risen through the organization in terms of taking on additional responsibilities or titles, it was important for the whole organization, and particularly after my brother retired. They mentioned when he retired, there were new roles for some for my sons. And consequently, bringing someone from the outside, I think, was important because it was a signal to all of our employees that we took the succession very seriously and that we had an objective point of view in terms of what roles my sons would be playing. And it, it, I think it lent it a, a bit of confidence to all of our employees that, you know, we're serious about this business and there's no sense of entitlement that these, you know, there have been, there haven't been promotions because of a last name and, I think one thing that we thought was very important is to treat everyone with respect and all of the people that we deal with, whether it's the person who's working in the warehouse or a person who's managing one of our departments, our ability to interact with them in a very positive way is very important. So uh, again, I, I think that bringing in someone from the outside to help make those determinations for us was very valuable just in terms of what it was signaling to the rest of our employees. So. Uh, I just wanted to add that as what I wanted. That's great. That's great. And I, and I just in terms of, you know, our employees, they're our greatest resource, uh, our employees are, and their ability to uh, be productive and work uh, very positively in terms of having the same goals in mind that we have, I think is extremely important. So that, you know, we really do value labor and we value those people who are such contributors to our company, and they're probably more so than we are. So. I mean, the recognition, I, I think having worked, you know, at, at certainly at most different positions within the company, I think it's taught us that everyone's contribution is extremely important. So uh, I, I do think that uh, we are all pulling in the same direction and we treat everyone as family. And I think that we, we introduce ourselves to our employees and, and really welcome them as part of our, our family unit. So. Uh, and, and it's more, you know, it sounds kind of corny, but I think that people see past that. I mean, people see that we are genuinely interested in their success and we appreciate what they do for us. That's great. So the employees become the extended family in a sense um, and, uh, and you take care of them. I think that's important, especially in today's labor market where obviously keeping your employees is super important and making sure that they develop. What do you what do you guys do at Byright to develop your employees? What kinds of career laddering or pathways do you focus on from a human resources or talent management point of view? Aaron, you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, you know, honestly, that sometimes Sean, it's it's actually quite a challenge uh, in that respect, and that we're we're somewhat of a flat company, and unlike a maybe a normal corporate structure, there aren't really 10 layers of, uh, of promotion to get to, you know, there's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a little bit tough like that. Um, and and yeah. so, you know, I guess what we, we really try to do is focus on every individual and, and see that they improve or try to lift them up. And, uh, you know, we do, I mean, we, we will look for ways to internally promote people 
we certainly, uh, you know, push them to be better and, and we'll never hold them back from educational opportunities. Uh, you know, and then I think it's, it's really, it's, it's allowing them the time. I think, you know, we're a place, if your kid has a little league game and you want to go to it, you know, go to it. You know, we have other people here that can, you know, take the shift. I, I think we try to be as flexible as the, as we can with those types of situations and really, try to nurture people where we can and, and help them along the way. So uh, that'd be my best answer for that one. Okay. Yeah. You guys have been voted one of the best places to work in the Bay area. Do you think, do you think those things that you've been talking about obviously are contributors to that? Is there any sort of special sauce in there that you would point to that would sort of make you that desirable employer of well, I think, uh, you know, it, it starts with, as, as Bill mentioned, that the day the employee comes, they're not just put through an HR, you know, uh, lesson and, and go through the, the, the normal steps of a company. They're brought around and introduced to each person who works at Byright, including uh, upper management. And, uh, you know, everyone's given a handshake and, and we like to say welcome to the family. So from their first day at Byright, we're we try to treat our employees as if they were our family because we are a family company. And we've seen, especially through the pandemic, that if you treat your employees well and show them respect and, and honor the contributions they make uh, to the company, they in turn want to work harder for uh, the company. And, you know, it, during this past year, we've been amazed with the contributions that our employees have put in, whether it's long hours or working at reduced pay just to get the company through this incredibly difficult time uh, in, in our industry, especially the restaurant industry was just decimated during the pandemic. And so, you know, we really saw the fruits of of our labor, if you will, uh, you know, with the employees really stepped up and showed that this company is theirs and and they they treat it as such and want to see it succeed. Um, and so it's it's been a great, great learning lesson through this past year. Yeah, it sounds like you guys model leadership and your and your employees kind of take that on themselves. It's what we would call scaling leadership throughout the organization. You've created an organization, flat organization, as you were saying, Aaron, where people can actually lead on their own and make those contributions. I, I think that's really interesting. Sean, um, some of it, yeah. like, some is self-serving because, you know, we're competing for uh, the best employee that we can find out there. And it's a very competitive situation. So, you know, honestly, uh, you know, part of, part of what we do is we, uh, reten employee retention is so important and being able to attract people who have uh, significant contributions that they have the potential to make with our company is something that I think we, we strive to do all the time. So, uh, you know, when you look at, let's say, areas of compensation, I, I think it's very important that we're always competitive in the marketplace. And mm -hmm. you know, typically, uh, we always challenge ourselves in terms of what is our competition doing? What does the labor force look like? You know, what level of compensation is appropriate for people's skill sets? But I think most importantly, mm -hmm. as we've all learned as managers, that a pat on the back is probably equally as important. So the, the sense that, you know, you're valuable to the company, that we know who you are, you're not a number, and we compete against large national companies. So, you know, the only way really to differentiate ourselves is you get to know these people and uh, develop a personal relationship with these people. And, and I think that's something that has really benefited us greatly. Wonderful. There are a couple of questions coming in here that I want to lob out to you guys. So the first one is, is there ever a challenge in keeping business talk in the office, right? And not letting it over <laughs> family time. Good question. How do you it guys depends on that? if we agree or don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> if we agree, we talk about it all the time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it's obviously, it, it can be a challenge, I guess. I mean, it could be, uh, it was, I, maybe it was more challenging for me when I was younger and, and uh, had a hotter head. You know, I think everyone would tell uh -huh. me I still have a hot head. Aaron, but, uh, I don't know that you've changed, actually. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it's learned. I mean, it's definitely learned and uh it, it, it can be challenging, but it's also, you know, it's, it's actually, it's, it's quite enjoyable sometimes that, you know, you, 
you have this deeper family relationship sometimes. I mean, I have friends that don't see their parents for multiple years. And I, I really, I tell a lot of my friends, I, every single morning I get to come in and have a cup of coffee and say good morning to my dad, you know, and I see my brother. And so, yeah, I mean, I guess, right, it, uh, cabin fever, it could be a little bit too much, but it really, it's, uh, it's. I think it's in some ways, you know, deepened my relationship uh, with, with my brothers and my father. And uh, you have a lot of uh, learned lessons together. And uh, so, you know, through the, you know, like any part of life, it's not a straight line, but the peaks are much better than the valleys. And uh, it's, it's been pretty enjoyable. Good. Um, another question came in. How has uh, innovation played a role in your company's development? Wow. Uh, it, it is. Uh, I. Our company is completely different than what it was when I was a kid working in the warehouse. Uh, it's been it's been pretty neat to see how you know technology and innovation have really changed how we do business and and things that we maybe focus on now that we can focus on that we were never able to before because you were sucked up in the minutia of uh, you know where you just didn't have the tools to do things so innovation has really you know i guess maybe allowed our our company to grow in certain ways to see customers that maybe we never thought you know buy right would ever really service or sell uh, and, you know, I, innovation in, in some ways helped us survive. You know, I think some of the technological innovations, if you will, uh, we had to challenge ourselves in this past year of really how can we use certain tools? You know, how can we maintain our, our culture and our community? It's something my dad has been pushing at us since, you know, this whole thing started last March with shelter in place is, is how can you keep this family and all these employees together and, and how can you keep them humming to the same tune? So, uh, you know, we've used some of those tools and we got creative and did, uh, you know, had a virtual employee party this past February and just have, have looked to any, any kind of way to use those. And it's always kind of started as really, how can we use them to improve our culture? And then they typically kind of flow into our business. Yeah. Bill, I think that's, that's, I admire, that the that the culture is really first in a sense and that drive at least this is what it sounds like and that drives productivity in the organization operational excellence in the organization so but but i but i don't think that that's typical honestly i think that there are a lot of owners out there who push the operational side of the business and just kind of hope that the culture might fall in place and you know often it doesn't so so where where did you I guess where did you come to the realization or has it always been there that culture was always going to be prime in your business model? I think I think it's it's been there, but I do think there's been an evolution. Uh, you know, the advantage of being the small distributor on the block back in the day, and not that we're we're a huge distributor at this very moment in time, but we've always been an underdog. So that, uh, as Aaron mentioned, I think from a technological point of view, I think we have many resources that would match our corporate competitors. But the only thing that really differentiates us is that we're, we're a family business. We promote the, the heck out of the fact that we are involved in the community, that mm -hmm. we are very involved in philanthropy, that we know who our customers are. So that, uh, but at the same token, you have to provide all of these resources to the customers that our competitors uh, offer them as well. But, you know, as I look at what is our edge, what's our edge in, in as we look at the landscape out there, and our edge really is the fact that we have a culture and it's very hard to replicate that when you have, you know, managers coming and going, being promoted, going to other states. The fact that it makes it much easier for us, obviously, that, you know, we are smaller, uh, comparatively speaking. Uh, but again, we know that we have an obligation to have all of the tools that the customers would require from us. But we, we've had employees come from, you know, other companies. Uh, I think we're an attractive company to work for. And after about a month uh, in this organization, it's remarkable that they say, boy, we had no idea. I mean, we walk in the door and we can feel, you know, a different atmosphere in terms of a sense of caring, a sense of working together uh, collaboratively. So 
uh, again, I think that's why culture for us is really important. If we were you know, triple or, or 10 times our size, I think perhaps it would be more difficult to retain it as I found over the years. But you know, that generally disappears after a period of time. Hmm. Yeah. So that you're in charge of finance and sales, which is an interesting combination. Usually that's, that's an interesting <laughs> mix of personalities because it's, it's got a right brain, left brain, right? So, so you, as, as managing the sales function, I would imagine that you're having, that you have been, that you have the opportunity, let's say, to have uh, some robust uh, conversations with your customers about their experience of the company. And does, do you believe that the, in those conversations, which undoubtedly have been challenging over the last year, I would think, um, is the culture showing up in the as well. I've seen some disconnects in some companies. The reason I'm asking is I see some disconnects sometimes between the culture, the operational culture and the sales culture. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you balance those? Are they totally well, aligned? There's definitely a push and pull between operations and sales. You know, sales wants to promise yeah. every customer of the world. And then I have to go back and fight with my brothers as to how to make it happen. <laughs> um, but, you know, one of my favorite things is going out with our sales crew and now you know that as the uh, restrictions have been lifted and, and meet with our customers and make that face-to-face -face connection as my dad uh, pointed out you know it it is our differentiator and it, and it makes us accountable you know we're out uh, eating at these restaurants uh, daily you know we live in the Bay Area and and we're constantly connected to our customers and and having those conversations whether good or bad uh, you know, makes our, our organization better because the customers can let us know where we might be deficient and we can change or they can let us know where we're excelling and then we can uh, use that to spread it out across the rest of the sales crew. Yeah. I like that you said there's always a tension between operations and sales. You're right about that. It's always kind of a push pull. Wait a minute. You told the customer we could do what in what period? Of That's why Nathan, who's in charge of our operations, wasn't allowed to be on this phone call. Just <laughs> That's right. We're missing that piece of the conversation. So um, what do you guys believe at this point uh, that you could do better? No one wants to take that question. What's happening out there? Uh, <laughs> I thought we lost the audio connection. We right. can do sales better. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think we can we can always fine tune what we do. I mean, I, I think even as uh, you know, you you've been so kind to lead this discussion, and we're focusing on on some of our better traits. You know, I, I think we could continue. You know, I we like many companies. You know, we lost some employees over the past 12 months and now we're starting to hire back uh and there's been some you know turnover in the workforce so i think it's it's that same work on on getting that culture all the way through the organization to making sure that that pushes through to our customers you know i i think uh my brothers and i i think we can always work better you know to in terms of both communication and and how we're kind of managing the business uh and then, you know, I, I think it's just a day to day thing. I mean, it's it helps that we're small and that Zach is out there and, and talking to customers. And I think, you know, the the learned lessons of the past 12 months is, is we don't know exactly what's happened to go forward and to keep an open ear to that customer and really kind of figure out what they want and what they need here as, as we ramp up and, and move into the summer and and start kind of moving on, uh, hopefully from this pandemic and uh be quick about it you know uh have open ears and, and figure out what's needed and and then to go out and execute on you know sean just to follow up on aaron uh you know i think as i think we've driven home during this whole conversation our our family business is you know the, the key to our success is family and the service that we provide our customers and our vendors and our employees and so for us you know our competitors have uh, you know, just an, an array of internet technologies and, and they're constantly figuring out how to have less employees and how to have uh, more, you know, mm. innovation so they can, can, can increase their bottom line. And for us, there's a constant uh, battle over how far do you push innovation while still maintaining that family 
uh, dynamic, that family business and that family customer mm -hmm. universe that, you know, differentiates us. So that's the constant conversation yeah. that Aaron and I and my dad and, and Nate have is, is where can we improve and how far can we push it without losing the identity that has made by right a success for so long. Yeah, I think that's really um, an interesting challenge. Um, I was going to ask you kind of as a thought experiment, and this is an interesting segue. So have you ever had to make a really tough decision? Maybe it wasn't so tough for you guys between, wow, we could that we could we could double our top line. I'm just making up numbers. We could really add a significant amount of business to our top line, but it doesn't actually really consider to be the buy right culture. It's going to threaten that. Did you ever have to deal with anything remotely like that? And what'd you do? Yeah, I, I think we've had uh, to deal with that. And as we look at customer segments, uh, I think that's where there has sometimes been a conflict that, you know, we can market ourselves as we have for many years to the independent operator in the greater San Francisco Bay Area, because we think that we have, you know, a relationship and a connection. Or we can go after large chain business and grow our top line sales significantly and probably spread ourselves out so we're you know we don't we don't offer that same level of service that i think the customers expected from us traditionally so you know i i think that's that's been an issue that you know do we do we get so large that we lose some of that and then you know we also lose that connect that personal connection with that smaller operator and that that's so we we've resisted growth to some degree uh mm -hmm. because we don't want to disrupt you know that relationship again that we feel is pretty important and we're i think we're also very we're pleased with our size i think we're we're very mm -hmm. efficient we are of the size that uh you know we're very comfortable we're very efficient we are profitable or at least we used to be before last year and yeah. uh you know, that's right in our wheelhouse. We can deliver the promises that we make to our customers and still be a very profitable company. So I think that uh, we resist growth to some degree because we think mm. it, it may disrupt, you know, our uh, our keys to success thus far. I think that level of self-awareness and self-reflection is, again, I admire it a great deal. Not, uh, I just want to reemphasize guys this, this i've worked with hundreds of businesses and this story is not common unfortunately so you guys bob buckley one of the one of the uh audience here who has a great business in for himself uh he said you guys should write a book called the barrelage bible <laughs> i think it's a great idea so um so uh if you if you could give advice to the other entrepreneurs that are here and they present, you know, but I'm sure we have a lot of business owners or a lot of people who may be interested in starting a business if they haven't already um, and are dealing with a lot of the issues that you're dealing with. I mean, my experience has always been it really, everybody's got to make the first buck, right? So everybody starts small for the most part, except if you're a tech company that can raise a zillion dollars and not start small, but most sort of, you know, shovel in the dirt type, businesses have to build up over a period of time. They're going to be a series of really important decisions as you go that'll, that'll, you know, inflect the business for better or worse. They're important to think about. And you guys obviously are very reflective and very thoughtful in the way that you do that. So if you, I'm just going to kind of go to each of you uh, in turn and, and Zach, I'll start with you and then Aaron and then Bill. If you had a piece of advice to give to an entrepreneur, younger, whatever, that from your experience, uh, about to build their business or about how to manage the, 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 the sort of um, uh, training up their next generation of leaders within their company. What would you say, in your opinion, the most important thing for them to think about would be? I would say uh, never give up your identity uh, for uh, for a dollar because um, the in the end, that's all you're, you're going to have is the person you are and the skill sets you have. Uh, and to trade those away for a quick buck is not in the long term going to prove, prove successful. Yeah. Those are temptations. It's hard to turn down business when you're trying to build a, when you're trying to build one, right? The temptation is to chase the dollar. Absolutely. Uh, Aaron, how about you? 
Well, it's going to be a rough conversation at Christmas because I think Zach stole my point. But uh, <laughs> I, I would also say, you know, on a, be be true to yourself and, and hold yourself accountable. You know, and I think it goes along with what Zach was saying, what, what Dad was saying about customers. But, you know, if, if faced with a decision, I think you really have to ask yourself, you know, if it – if if what if what you're choosing to do is true to what you want to be and what you want your business to be and i you know sometimes that ends up maybe a, a past opportunity every once in a while but the the long haul you know i think is a big payoff and and i found that in in the things that i've done or in my business experiences uh you know it's really important that you you stay true to yourself and and you know what you're about and you know what what you want your company to represent and you know if it fits that then you know it, it's probably going to end up in the right direction you know, it might not happen tomorrow but it's uh there's some payoff there mm -hmm. great and bill i would say find something that you're extremely passionate about uh you know your business or your career shouldn't be a job it should be something that you find great fulfillment in so uh, you can't be successful unless you love what you're doing. And I think it's so important. A lot of times I hear people say, oh, you know, why don't I do that? I bet you they can make a lot of money doing that or another business or whatever. But what you really need to do is be extremely passionate, really find fulfillment in what you do. And additionally, it requires great sacrifice and tenacity. So, you know, I remind my sons all the time that they're living on easy street because you know, we can pay our vendors and we can meet payroll. But, you know, when you're a small company, it's pretty tough to do those things. So uh, the way you overcome that is just because, you know, you're, you just show great tenacity, a wonderful work ethic, and you can overcome all of those challenges. You know, just as a, you know, as a side note, I've been so impressed by restaurant operators during the, the pandemic, the amount of challenges that they faced, mm -hmm. and they really endured and they've come back or most have come back, I should say. It yeah. required, you know, tremendous leadership, tremendous sacrifice. And really those, I admire them as business people because, uh, you know, they got through this thing and that's really a sign of yeah. a successful entrepreneur. Yeah, and I, and I have, I think every disco should go eat out at least once a week. Absolutely. Because they really have, and, and if you know somebody in healthcare, pat them on the back, please give them a hug, something because they have been remarkable during this period. I, I um, just, just as a, I want to remind folks, we have a few minutes here. If you want to ask a question or chat with something, this would be the time. Um, and while we're, while we're waiting for any questions that come in, what, what, uh, Aaron and Zach, what's your experience of leadership? Your, your boots on the ground here. What's your experience of leadership been over the past year? What have you had to challenge yourself to do as leaders? Well, I think it all starts, uh, you know, there were a lot of tough choices that had to be made over the past 12 months. Uh, and again, balancing that business identity and, and, and the desire to treat our employees as our family and, uh, you know, coming back to your question, uh, what hard financial decisions have you had to make? Uh, and this pandemic has has really tested our our limits uh, with with mm -hmm. those decisions. Um, but you know, as I mentioned before, the flip side of that is the employees who uh, are with us are so determined to get our company through this that they really have made these tough choices a lot easier. Yeah, good point, Aaron. Yeah, you know, I uh, this this year seems like it was a, a lifetime of of business decisions happening in in one year, or the kind of decisions you had to make. And I think Dad alluded to it. I think for for me, and I think it's fair to say for Zach and Nate, you know, we've we've had a pretty good run here being in the restaurant business in the Bay Area. You know, we actually, and now you kind of bite your tongue, but we could talk to our peers across the country during the last recession and. You know, really, th this area didn't feel it in terms of restaurant business. You know, it was felt in other areas, mm -hmm. but really, the restaurant business kind of kept going. And this really was the first time that that we showed up to work, and you really had to ask yourself if Byright was going to be here tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, and if the industry would be here tomorrow. And that, you know, standing on the precipice is a was a mm -hmm. unique experience in a different way of kind of looking at, at the whole situation and and the whole business. So. Uh, in some ways, it brought a, a certain gratitude and, and new appreciation for 
what's been built here and really, you know, a, a different way of looking and making sure that when you come, you know, don't take it for granted, you know, uh, yeah. a, a very good refresher of, of don't take it for granted and, and nothing's guaranteed, you know, it really, you, you think sometimes I've now been doing this for a while, you think you kind of know what the industry is going to do and this time of year we do this and this type of year we do that and, and the whole road plan kind of got ripped up. So uh, yeah. definitely uh, be thinking a little bit more creatively about what can come, what could come up next. And, and again, don't take it for granted and mm -hmm. uh, it's going to take a lot of hard work each day to kind of make it keep going. So it was, uh, it was a good learning year. Yeah. Bill, you must be very proud. I am. Yeah. It's uh, it's very rewarding. I, you know, when my uh, early on in their careers, I'd frequently ask them if they were, if they felt good about their role here and if they enjoyed working here. And I continue to remind them if they didn't, they should leave and find something that they were really passionate about. And so I never really found that I, I, I don't think I forced them into this organization. And I've been delighted. They've really stepped up. And particularly during the pandemic, as Aaron mentioned, uh, you know, it was a, a, a whole different situation for the organization. And frankly, you know, they were the ones who uh, engineered all of these these changes and got us through this thing. And uh, I was sitting very comfortably uh, at my desk a couple days a week and not worrying about things. So uh, they really took charge and they're to be a, they're to be applauded. They've done very well. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, guys, we're, we're so grateful for the time that you could spend with us today and the wisdom that you shared. Thank you very much for it. Um, and I want to thank everyone else for attending the uh, USF New Roots, New, Ro New, Roots, New Routes uh, virtual convening. We invite you to join, uh, join us for the 2021 Gellert Center reception. It begins at 4.40 p.m. on Zoom. Uh, with a virtual wine tasting by Paula Harrell, Hel sorry, Paula Harrell from P. Harrell Wines. Grab your wine and your glass and join us for some wine tips and toasting. Let's celebrate the award winners and our vibrant business community. Thank goodness for that. We'll see you at 4.40 p.m. again. Uh, guys, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you again. Take care.